uh, introducing the minimal supersymmetric standard model. Here's the uh, executive summary. It's a list of all the chiral superfields that we have. We had, to, we had to add an additional Higgs doublet, okay? And um, the first thing I want to talk about today, begin with, is, so we talked about the various uh, soft supersymmetry breaking terms that we would need to, to, to add, okay? And so now we want to begin to talk about the, the phenomenology of this model. And I want to start, of course, with the Higgs. The Higgs is the main motivation for supersymmetry. The Higgs has been discovered. It's certainly the natural place to start. Now, we have a lot of scalar fields in the theory. We have scalar quarks, leptons. We have quarks, sleptons, and so on. But we are going to assume that they have positive quadratic terms, in other words, positive mass squared terms in the potential, so that they are, when we minimize the full potential of all scalars, they will have zero VEVs. That means that we can discuss the Higgs separately. We can just set to zero the VEVs of all the other scalars, okay? So we can discuss the Higgs in isolation. So let's first of all uh, step back and think about what happens if we do not have supersymmetry breaking for just a second, okay? If we don't have any supersymmetry breaking, we look at the Higgs, then the only contributions to the Higgs potential come from the d-term potential, from the SU2 cross U1 gauge interactions, and from this mu term, this term right here in the superpotential. Okay? And so this term right here will give us a positive mass squared for the scalar Higgses, and the d-term gives us a positive quartic, and so we have a nice stable potential, that's good, but no electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay? So, <clears throat> yeah, here's the f-term. The f-term is, uh, uh, is just a positive mass for h up and h down. The d-term here is, uh, looks like this. It's the square of the sum of generators. Uh, this form right here is, the, is, is not the most useful form. You can simplify it using this identity here uh, for any SUN, for SU2 generators, okay? And we can find a more uh, uh, conventional looking form of the D term here, okay? So uh, these are the only contributions to the Higgs potential in the supersymmetric limit. Okay, so but from this we already see sort of what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a model with two Higgs doublet with a specific sort of potential. Okay, and as I said here, electroweak symmetry is unbroken in the supersymmetric limit. So now let's add soft, the soft Susie breaking terms. And what are the terms that involve uh, H up and H down? Well, we have, again, uh, mass, we're independent, uh, 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 mass terms for H up and H down, and now they can be different. The mu term gave the same mass, right, for H up and H down. And we have this so-called B term right here, okay, the sort of holomorphic quadratic term, okay? And now, uh, and, 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 and notice it's very important, there are no additional quadratic terms, right? The quadratic terms, the dimensionless couplings, we cannot change with soft Susie breaking. Now, these mass terms here are just, as far as we can say, they're free parameters. They're they're, 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 we don't know what they are. We can choose them to be anything we like. And in particular, they can be negative. So we can have negative quadratic terms. So now we can have uh, electroweak symmetry breaking. We can have the origin be unstable. Okay? And I'm sorry, sometimes I left in these little H's. Um, okay. But anyway, um, no, if you look back at the... the, the uh, the, 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 the supersymmetric terms, you can see that everything there was manifestly uh, uh, real. All the couplings were manifestly real in the Higgs potential. B could, in principle, have a complex phase, but we could rescale or rephase the, the fields. These should be capital H's here to make B real and positive without any loss of generality. Okay? So, summarizing everything so far about the Higgs, here is the tree-level potential for the Higgs, the two Higgs fields in the MSSM, OK? 
Okay? And here I've written these, these combinations here, the, the quadratic terms, I've, I've written, I've, I've combined them here. So the quadratic terms for the Higgs mass are a combination of the soft SUSY breaking parameters and the mu term. That'll be important later. Okay? Okay. So now let's find out, let's minimize this potential. Okay? And uh, when we have a two Higgs doublet model like this, uh, for one of the Higgs doublets, we can do what we normally do in the standard model. Namely, we can just choose a gauge to make H have this form. If H has some non-zero entry here, we can just make an SU2 transformation to rotate it down here. If there's a phase here, we can use a U1 hypercharge transformation to rotate the phase away. Okay? But once we've done this, then we've used up our complete freedom our, our, of, of making, we can't make any further gauge transformations without messing this up. So the most general form of the down type uh, Higgs VEV is like this. It's got arbitrary things in both positions. It's got arbitrary phases, okay? And all these phases for, are angles, theta, delta, and eta. All these things are angles. And all these angles have to be determined by minimizing the potential, okay? So you're just supposed to plug this into the previous potential and do the minimization, all right? And when you do that, you find that all these angles are zero. They're just minimized at zero, okay? And so I can write this form right here, okay? And this is very nice because if you remember that H up and H down had opposite hypercharge, this is exactly the direction of the VEV that preserves electromagnetism. So when you have a two Higgs doublet model, you cannot take for granted that you have the right symmetry breaking pattern. It could happen that you uh, break electromagnetism. So our first phenomenological success, if you like, of the MSSM is that in fact it does, it can break electroweak symmetry in the right pattern, okay? Now we have two VEVs, V up and V down. We have two non-zero VEVs in general. And so uh, the sum of the squares of these things is what enters into the W and Z masses, okay? Because we have one kinetic term for this that gives us a W mass squared proportional to this squared and another one that gives us another term that gives us a contribution to the W mass squared proportional to that term. So it's the sum of the squares of these things that has to be equal to the V, the VEV in the standard model. Yes? Okay, so you, the question is, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm making it a little bit more brief, but I think you're saying that, um, that, that we are setting the other VEVs to zero by hand, okay, but that that should be justified in some way. Can I, okay? Sorry. Okay, so you're asking about somehow the renormalization conditions and their connection to the, to the other scalar masses. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not maybe quite getting your question, but I think that, I think that the, the that renormalization doesn't have, uh, renormalization enters only in the following way. When we're talking about these parameters here, we're talking about parameters renormalized at the TeV scale, okay? And so at the TeV scale, we're going to need these parameters, for example, well, I don't have parameters up here, but the parameters in the Higgs potential, they have to be renormalized at the TeV scale, and we will have phenomenological constraints on what they can be. Similarly, the squark and slepton, the other scalars that we have in the theory, the squarks and sleptons and so on, they all must have positive masses at the weak scale. Okay? Now, they may not have, in principle, they could have negative masses at some renormalized at some, on some much larger scale. And we have, may have to worry about that if we're interested in the connection to physics at much larger scales. But here we're just working at the TeV scale.
Yeah, the question is, do we, are we setting the VEVs equal to zero by hand because we have positive mass squares at the weak scale? So I would say that, yes, we are assuming that the VEVs, or the, sorry, we are assuming that the mass squares of the other scalars are positive at the weak scale, but that means that their, their potential is then minimized at zero, so it's not an extra assumption. Their potential, if we minimize it, it will just have a minimum at zero. That's right, but the potential is a sum of a million terms, not a million, but a lot of terms, right, for all the scalars. And what I'm saying is that if you minimize the full potential, the squarks and sleptons will have their minimum at zero VEV, okay, because we're assuming that the quadratic terms are, are positive, okay, right? So, um, so you know, the, the, the potential looks like, you know, some squark mass squared, squark squared, plus some slepton mass squared, slepton squared, and many, many other terms. But if all of these things are positive, right, then minimizing this potential just gives us that those VEVs are zero, okay? It is a constraint on the theory, but it's, it's one that's easily satisfied, okay? Other questions? Okay. So, <coughs> It's, uh, it's conventional to take the ratio of these VEVs and call it tan beta. So we have a little triangle like this, okay, with V up and V down on the sides and V on the diagonal. And now these parameters, V up and V down, the VEVs of the Higgs fields are determined by minimizing this potential. We have two VEVs, V up and V down, so we have two minimization conditions. And they can be written like this. Okay, so they give some relationship between the parameters that we want, namely uh, the parameters, for example, MH up effective and so on, and the VEVs. Okay? Now the VEVs are sort of hidden here in, uh, in, in, in MZ and beta. Okay? So beta is the ratio of the VEVs, and MZ is of course proportional to the VEV. Okay? So, this is, so here this is really, this is the traditional way of, of, of writing it, or one of the traditional ways people write it. You'll see these kinds of things. But it's really just a condition that determines the VEVs in terms of the fundamental parameters. Okay? All right? Now, um, this way of writing things uh, is helpful if you want to understand, you know, relationship between parameters and, uh, and, and, uh, and what we observe, but it's important to understand what's going on here. Why is MZ? So, so, so the, the important point about these equations for, for, for us here is that it's really telling us that, uh, that unless, if we, don't, if we want to avoid any big cancellations here, we need all these parameters to be of order MZ. Okay, so MZ is appearing because the quadratic term is proportional to this combination of gauge couplings, and if we want to avoid any cancellations here, all these mass parameters should be of order MZ, okay? And uh, this is arising, stepping back a little bit, there's a lot of, there's two Higgs doublets, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but the basic point is just, whenever we have a, a Higgs model, the VEV squared is the quadratic term divided by the quartic term. Okay, and here the quadratic terms are these various soft terms, okay, and the, the quartic term is exactly g squared plus g prime squared, okay, and so of course mh squared comes out to be, should be of order mz squared, so that's what's going on, barring any weird big cancellations, okay, so it's not a surprise, okay, okay, so if we get this minimum that we want, then we want to know, we want to know actually about the 125 GeV Higgs, and we also want that we've observed at the LHC, and we also want to know what about all these other Higgses that we have, right? Where are they? So let's, uh, let's just take our two doublets, and we expand around the VEVs, okay? So the excitations in the VEV directions are neutral, and the excitations perpendicular to the VEV directions are charged, as usual. And these various Higgs fields here split up into uh, a pair of, oops, now this, now the, yeah, no, no, it's right, it's right. There are two neutral, two CP even neutral, two CP odd neutral, and two charged scalars, right? But now, as we know from the standard model, we know that there are, among these, when we, when we work out the mass matrices, there will be three massless 
Nambu-Goldstone bosons that are going to become the longitudinal components of the W and Z, right? And the same thing has to happen here. Out of these six fields, right, or however, however you count, out of these fields, three of them are going to be, uh, become the longitudinal components of the W and Z, okay? So if we remove those from, the, uh, from consideration, the physical scalars, right, not the ones that become the longitudinal W and Z, there remain two CP even guys, one CP odd and one charged uh, Higgs scalar. And uh, you can work out the second derivative of the potential and plug back in the conditions that, uh, uh, for the VEVs that I wrote down before. Okay? And this, this, is, this is done in many, uh, in detail. The details of what I'm doing, for example, are extremely very nicely explained in the review by uh, Steve Martin that I uh, gave earlier. Okay? And, and so you can find the, the, the masses for all of these guys. Uh, notice that you know, it's a two by two mass matrix, so finding the eigenvalues is a quadratic equation, so we can write down simple solutions. Notice that the A mass, the, the CP, even, sorry, this should be CP odd. Yeah, okay, that guy, that slide guy again. I'm, I've talked to him, but he keeps screwing up. Um, the, uh, this, this, this should be odd. The, 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 the A0, the, the neutral CP odd guy, has an extremely nice simple formula in terms of the fundamental parameters. So it's, it's often done to use this as an input parameter, right? Because it is, almost is an input parameter, okay? And so we've written the, the, the masses of the, 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 the CP even neutral guys uh, in terms of A0, right? Which is really just this sum right here, okay? All right. Now, of course, the burning question that you, you, you have is we're, we're interested in the 125 GeV uh, Higgs. And so, of course, oh, I, I should also just explain the notation. It's, it's very conventional, so uh, uh, it'll help you read the literature. Usually, we use the little h0 to be, yeah, to be denote the light guy. Okay, so whichever guy is the lightest is the little h0. And that's a mixture of the other neutral guys. You can find all the formulas for this in the review by Martin, for example, okay? So we want to identify the little h0, the light CP even guy, with the Higgs boson that's been observed at the LHC, right? Okay, so let's see if we can fit that, what that tells us from that formula, okay? And the answer is that it doesn't work, it fails. And the reason, if you go back to that formula, if you look at it a little more carefully, you can actually see that, so, uh, you know, there's an A's here, MA here, MA here, which is really just these parameters. So this is really a function of MA, right? And you can actually see that this is a monotonically increasing function of MA. It's not hard to see that, okay? And then, if you take MA goes to infinity, take this thing to be as big as you can, you get MZ cos to beta. That's bad. That's less than 91 GeV, okay? That's not only incompatible with the uh, LHC discovery, it was already ruled out in the 1990s by LEP, okay? And it's not hard to understand what the root of the problem is, okay? Once again, if you step back from these, these, the, the, the complications of these formulas, the point is that the quartic we have some Higgs potential. The quartic coupling is G squared plus G prime squared. That's a direct result of supersymmetry, right? Supersymmetry, this beautiful symmetry, fixed a lot of, fixed the renormalizable couplings of the theory. It fixed the quadratic coupling to be, the quartic coupling of the Higgs to be related to the gauge couplings. So this is a very intrinsic property of supersymmetry. And once the quartic coupling is, is, is fixed to be this, well, it, the, the, uh, generically a Higgs mass would be the quartic coupling, Higgs mass squared is the quartic coupling times the VEB squared, and indeed that is MZ squared. And what this thing says is that if you put in all the details, you can't get anything bigger than MZ squared. Okay. So this also tells us that we need some additional, con what we need to do to fix this problem. I'm sorry, yeah? So go ahead and shout it out. I'll repeat the question. What's the point of taking the 
to make this mod, to, to get as close as I can to 125 GeV. So I don't really have to take it infinity. It's enough if I take it to be 400 GeV, I might get, instead of 91 GeV, I might get 90 GeV or something. I mean, the point is just that I want to take MA as large as I can. I don't literally take, I never take anything to infinity, right? But I need to take it large. So I'm being as optimistic as I can and trying to, 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 you know, to fit what I want. Okay? Uh, sorry, did I repeat the question? The question is, what was the point of taking MA to infinity? I, sorry. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so we need, so it's clear from this what it is that we need to solve the problem. The problem is just this quartic. This quartic is too small. The gauge couplings are what they are. We can't change them. They are too small for this purpose. Okay? Now, in fact, such contributions do exist within the MSSM itself, namely loops. We have so far just considered the tree-level potential, okay? Uh, you know, if you're a phenomenologist, you do tree-level until you get desperate, and then you look at loops, right, when they don't work. So, okay. So let's look at loops, okay? Is there any reason to think that loop effects could be big in this case? Well, loop effects can be big precisely when something is small at tree-level, right? When something is sort of anomalously small at tree level, loops can be important. This may be such a case because g squared plus g prime squared is a relatively small number. It comes with a one-eighth, you know, in the potential, in the quartic and so on. Um, and so anyway, what we want are the biggest loop corrections, obviously. And the biggest loop corrections come from the particles with the biggest coupling to the Higgs. And those are the top and the stop. Okay? So just as in the standard model, we have a... a, 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 a a left-handed and a right-handed uh, top, okay? So here's the translation between our left-handed vial language and the mo more conventional left and right-handed language we use in the standard model. Uh, in the MSSM, we have left and right-handed stops. Namely, we have the scalar superpartners of the left and right-handed top fields, okay? And so we actually have two scalar tops. We have stop left and stop right. And after electroweak symmetry breaking, these guys have the same quantum numbers, and therefore they can mix. Okay? In the standard model, we don't think of the top left and the top right as mixing. It's because they have different Lorentz quantum numbers. One is a left-handed fermion, one is a right-handed fermion. But these are scalars, right? The stop left and the stop right are scalars. They, can certainly, have the, they certainly have the same Lorentz quantum numbers. So after electroweak symmetry breaking, they have the same gauge quantum numbers, and so they can mix, and they do. Okay? And the whole, uh, the, the complete, uh, I'm not going to write down the complete stop potential. I, one of the many things I have to choose, I chose to leave out in all of this. But I'm just going to neglect the stop mixing, okay? It doesn't qualitatively change, it changes the story only by some details, okay? So I'm just going to assume that the stop left and the stop right have the same mass and they don't mix. I'll make a little comment about mixing at the, at the end. All right. So what are these loops? Well, these are actually, uh, remember, we, we, we talked about some of the, 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 we began this series of lectures by talking about top and stop loops, okay? So here they are again, but now we actually uh, hopefully know a little bit more about supersymmetry than when we started. Um, so we have this, um, this uh, super potential coupling, right, between the, 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 the third generation left-handed quark H up, right-handed uh, uptype guy, and now this thing here uh, is, you know, gives the same thing that gives us the Yukawa couplings also gives us a contribution to the potential. If we take the derivative of this um, with respect to um, these the, the 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 squark fields here, we'll get a quartic term like this that involves H up and the uh, squark fields. Okay. So we get a quartic coupling like this between H up and stops, okay? So if we want to correct the quartic, we have to look at diagrams like this, okay? And if we include some of the effects that give us stop mixing, there are a few other, there are a few other contributions, but this is uh, already good enough for the, for the parametrics, okay? Now, <clears throat> you know, you should always uh, estimate things before you calculate them, right? And so, before, without doing any calculations, we can see that this has, each of these diagrams has four powers of y top. 
This one, it's obvious because this is the top loop. I have one, two, three, four powers of y top. This one right here also has four powers of y top because the, the coordinate coupling is proportional to y top squared. Okay, so we have a, a, a y top to the fourth here. We have a one over 16 pi squared because every loop always gives you a one over 16 pi squared. That's how it is. It comes from the d fourth uh, momentum integral. Factor of three for colors. And now we know that this thing has to be a dimensionless thing. It's a correction to a Higgs quartic. So therefore it's dimensionless. So we can't put any, the only dependence that we can have on the masses, m top and m stop, can be logarithmic, right? And furthermore, we know that these effects, these corrections have to go to zero if m stop equals m top. Because if m stop equals m top, then as far as these diagrams know, this is a completely supersymmetric theory, okay? So with all, putting that all together, we know that it has to have this form. Okay, just without, without doing any calculation. Okay, all right. And then we can take this thing and we can plug it into the correction to the physical Higgs mass. It will be a correction proportional to the correction to the quartic times the VEV squared. Okay, so these squigglies mean I'm doing order, you know, I'm doing simple estimates putting in the factors that I know. Okay, so, sorry, thank you, yes? I'm sorry, you're going to have to repeat that. OK, you're asking, did we already use supersymmetry to, to, to cancel the contributions to the Higgs mass? So my answer to that is, stay tuned. Wait just a few moments. We're going to get to that, exactly that topic. But, but yes, uh, we're, we're talking about exactly, this is exactly the context in which we said, at the very first lecture, we were canceling the loop contribution to the Higgs. Uh, mass squared. That exactly happens when we consider the mass squared, which we will in just, in just a few slides. Okay? So if I did not, don't answer your question then, please ask it again. Okay? So, so here, this was a very simple estimate. Okay? How well does it actually do? It's essentially perfect. Okay? Because if you go and look up the actual formula that you find, okay, in, in uh, the actual formula with all the factors, here it is. Okay, it's just changed by a factor of two from what I said. Okay, so, all right. So, um, you know, you should never be afraid of doing these kinds of estimates, okay, because uh, it, it, really is, it really is good, okay. There's one thing that comes in here that I've neglected, which is there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a mixing angle among the Higgs because the 125 GV Higgs is a mixture of the other states and there's a parameter involved there. But I've made the optimistic choice, I'm always making the optimistic choice here to make the model fit as well as possible, which is in this case to assume that the mass eigenstate is nearly the uptype guy, okay? So the light Higgs we've seen is dominantly the guy that couples to the top quark, okay? That is the optimistic choice here, all right? And so you can plug into this, you can now plug into this. We know what Y top is. We know what M top is. The only thing in this formula we don't, oh, I'm sorry. It's very important. There should be a four here, okay? Sorry, there's a four here, um, you know, and that just came from, the fact that, you know, these things, this, are y, this is y top to the fourth. So there, I did actually get the number of powers of y top right, okay? There should be a y top to the fourth here. Okay, so we know y top, we know m top. The only thing in this formula, we know v. The only thing in this formula we don't know is the stop mass, right? So we can just figure out how big of a stop mass do we need to make this work, okay? And the answer is 880 GeV, if you plug in the numbers, okay? Um, however, it turns out that estimating the stop mass is an extremely delicate thing. In other words, estimating the value of the stop mass in the MSSM that I need to get the right Higgs mass is a very delicate thing. And you can kind of see that because it appears in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in a logarithm, right? And so if, you appear, if you, something appears in a logarithm, then the, this value is very insensitive to that. Conversely, this, this value is not very well determined, right? And in fact, higher loop corrections are enormously important. And just to give an example, one uh, a, a loop, a next order loop uh, calculation that's very important is just the QCD correction to the top mass itself. At tree level, I would say that M top is Y top V over root two, right? It should actually be a V up, I guess, okay? All right, 
Um, but at one loop, there's a correction. It's a QCD correction. And that correction is huge. So this number, if I, use, if I include the one loop correction, instead of getting 173 GeV for this combination, I would get 163. Okay? And, and if I just put in this correction, just as an illustration, just put in only this correction and correct this formula, I would find that the stop mass needs to be 1.3 TeV instead. Okay? But that's just one example. Okay, there, there are actually many other QCD corrections. Okay? And here's the full result of an official, this is a whole industry of people who do this. Okay? Here's a, the, uh, one of the most recent uh, results on this. Okay? So I need to explain what you're looking at. On the vertical axis, you have the stop mass. This is the stop mass you need to get 125 GeV Higgs. Okay? That's just one number. What's plotted here on the other, ver the horizontal axis, is this A parameter. This is this cubic uh, scalar interaction. This gives rise to the mixing between the stop the stops, okay, which is the thing that I've neglected. So what I've been talking about is A equals zero right here. And we see that the answer is it's about 10 TeV, actually. Okay, it's about 10 TeV. You actually need a 10 TeV stop if you don't have any mixing to make this work. Okay? So one lesson here is that radiative people who do calculate radiative, sometimes it is very important to calculate radiative corrections very accurately. Okay. Now, with, with, if we have a stop that is that heavy, we really have to worry about the problem that we started with very, at the very beginning of the first lecture, which is to say that the whole point of supersymmetry, the whole reason we're talking about this, is that we wanted to cancel the, 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 the quadratic contribution to the Higgs mass parameter from heavy particles. But now we're being forced to introduce a heavy particle, namely the stop itself. So we should go back to the quadratic corrections to the Higgs mass. And here they are. Okay, this is back from the first lecture, exactly the, I, don't, I think it's well, supposed to be the same formula. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, and, and now let's see how big it is. Well, how big is this log? This log comes from the fact that supersymmetry is broken at some scale lambda, which we've seen is generally much, much larger. Okay? But again, let's be optimistic. We're trying to be as optimistic as possible. And so we'll just assume that this log is like 1. Okay? This, in other words, lambda is not very much bigger than the stop mass. Supersymmetry is broken around 10 TeV, roughly. Okay? And then what we find is that this correction to the Higgs mass squared parameter is about 1,000 times bigger than what it needs to be to break electroweak symmetry. Okay? So if you remember that we had some effective MH up squared, which was the MH up squared in the mass parameter plus the mu term, right? Okay? And so what we're talking about here are that, that the, the stop corrects this thing. The stop loop corrects this thing right here. Okay? But we can always choose this to cancel this. But now we have, this is 10 to the 3 times too big, so we have to cancel these two things to one part in 10 to the 3. Okay? Now, if we allow this stop mixing, things get a lot more complicated, okay? Um, but it helps a bit because you can see that if you have very large values of this stop mixing parameter A top, then you can live with a stop of around 2 TeV or maybe 1.5 TeV or something, okay? And then if you do the same thing, you have to worry about the fact that you do get an additional contribution to the Higgs mass squared also proportional to this parameter, but you can still get, you can prove things a bit, you can make it instead of 1,000 times too big, it's only about 100 times too big. And this is, again, being extremely optimistic. The problem is much worse if you have high-scale supersymmetry breaking. What is the cons imposed constraint on this figure right here? Okay, what is the, 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 here in this figure right here, we have just looked at the Higgs potential, okay, including all radiative corrections and including this uh, stop mixing parameter. 
And what we found is the allowed parameter space that reproduces 125 GeV Higgs boson. Okay? These, are, these are extremely sophisticated calculations. They go to uh, two loops, some effects to higher loops. Okay? So this should worry you. If you're worried, you're right. You're paying attention, okay? Because eliminating exactly this kind of quadratic sensitivity was precisely the motivation for supersymmetry. Okay? Let's let that sink in. So this motivates, actually, so what, how should we think about this? Well, before we get too depressed, we should realize that this was specific to the MSSM, the minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay? Supersymmetry is a much bigger idea, although you wouldn't know that by going to a lot of conferences. right? But it's true. Supersymmetry is a much grander idea than the MSSM. And so this actually strongly motivates models of supersymmetry that go beyond the MSSM. Okay? Sometimes the minimal thing is not enough. If we had minimality, we would only have one generation, right? You and I are just made out of one generation. We don't need anything else, but we have it. We don't know why, right? So here, uh, one example of this is if we go to the next to minimal supersymmetric standard model. That is, take the MSSM, take the same wallet card that I've been showing you, add to it a single chiral superfield S. So we add one more thing to the list. It is a Chiral, it is a gauge singlet. And now, when I have this additional superfield, S, I can add additional terms to the Lagrangian. I can add to the superpotential terms like this, lambda S, H up, H down, and S cubed. Okay? And now, I can get an additional, if I look at the, the, the F term, there's a term which is proportional to dW dS squared, which looks like this, and that has an additional quartic. And now I have a tree-level quartic in my Lagrangian, and lambda is just some new parameter in my model. I can choose it however I want, okay? And I can choose it big enough to get 125 GeV Higgs mass. No problem, okay? Now, of course, you, want to do the, you would want to do the detailed phenomenology of this, and maybe you will discover some issues, and there, 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 there are, but basically it's, it's fine. Questions? Yes, please. Sorry, can you just speak up? Because I can't, I can't hear you. I need to hear you. Yeah, I think the question is, the, the, when I showed the stop loops, where, was, I, where I, was I calculating a contribution to the effective potential? The answer is yes, absolutely. That's what I'm doing. So uh, the technical uh, thing is that I'm computing the Coleman-Weinberg potential, right? So the, 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 at tree level, we have a potential that we read off from the Lagrangian. At higher loop order, there, is, there are corrections to that. Okay. Um, if you want to read about those, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm an old guy, but the, the standard reference back in my day was a physics report by Mark Scher, S-H-E-R. But I think that's probably still a decent reference. Okay. Also, many quantum field theory textbooks talk about it a little bit. Okay. Okay. So, so that is what it is. Okay. So now, uh, but we, we also have to talk about the rest of the, the model, okay, not just the Higgs. Okay, there's lots of things in the MSSM. Uh, that's why people, there are people who, as far as I can tell, they literally spend their entire lives working on the MSSM. Uh, uh, so anyway, what is the, let, we can ask, okay, we have many, many other particles in the MSSM. What do we expect? Okay, we have many parameters, so if we don't have any expectation, we're... <laughs> Okay, so, in fact, we have an extremely strong hint, extremely strong hint. It's so strong that we would be foolish to ignore it. And that is that we have, uh, remember when we wrote down the soft scalar masses, we have a lot of these masses because we have three generations of quarks and leptons. And so these 
mass squared things are really three by three matrices. And they're, right, they're Hermitian, but they're otherwise arbitrary a priori. Okay? And in particular, there's no a priori reason why these three by three matrices should be diagonal in the same basis that diagonalizes the, the, the quark and lepton masses. Okay? And if that's the case, then we have a new source of flavor violation right, in the theory. In addition to the Yukawa couplings, we have these things. Okay? So, for example, and these are really dangerous because, for example, one of the most sensitive or the most sensitive thing is KK bar mixing. In the standard model, because of the off diagonal Yukawa couplings, we get box diagrams like this, and they give us some four fermion interaction. And notice it's suppressed by uh, M MW to the fourth, okay? And it's proportional to the charm course mass squared. That's a complicated thing that comes from the gym mechanism, okay? There are other contributions as well, anyway. But this is complicated. But the point is, it's sort of a light. Anyway, it's like this, basically. Okay. All right. In the MSSM, we have similar box diagrams where we replace various particles by their superpartners. And actually, one of the biggest ones involves the exchange of a gluino. So a, an S quark can emit a gluino and turn into an S squark. The S squark can mix with a D squark and via a gluino, turn back into a D, and then the opposite thing down here, okay? So this kind of diagram uh, can, can occur, and again, you should not be afraid to estimate these things. It's a one-loop guy. It has one, two, three, four powers of the strong coupling. It needs two insertions of these off-diagonal mass squareds, and so the rest of the dimensions, since this is a dimension six operator, they have to be, there has to be some M Susie to the sixth, these are the heavy masses that are flowing around this loop. So they're of order M gluino, M squark, something like that. Okay? And now we need this to be small, about the same size as that, because this thing, this thing right here you know, explains KK bar mixing. The standard model does a good job of explaining KK bar mixing. So this can't be any bigger than that. And that tells us that this off diagonal mixing, compared to this guy right here, has to be something like 10 to the minus 3 if this, this should be M Susie here, if these Susie masses are near a TeV, okay? To be honest, if you really plug in these numbers, you'll get a small, you'll, you'll get a less dramatic effect here. This number really comes from the detailed calculation, okay? But I've used the value from the detailed calculation. And it's not just this one entry that has to be small. There are many other entries that have to be small. Okay, and there's also BB bar and DD bar mixing. I mean, the story repeats many times for many other off-diagonal entries. Okay, so uh, this very strongly suggests that there should be some reason that we should not have these cannot be arbitrary matrices, obviously. So there should be some principle underlying the flavor structure. And there's a very very simple and natural ansatz, which is just that these three by three matrices are proportional to the identity matrix. Okay, all right, and this ansatz, this you, this invariance under this this ansatz is invariant under the flavor rotations that diagonalize the quark and lepton masses. Okay, because basically these guys transform oppositely. Okay, the two indices transform oppositely under those rotations. Okay. And similarly, for the A terms, we can make an ansatz that they are proportional to, uh, to Yukawa couplings. Okay? And there are very good theoretical justifications for this. I'm not going to talk about right now. I'm not going to get to talk about it in this lecture. But you can also have very good theoretical justifications for this. It's not just a phenomenological ansatz. Okay? Okay, so if we do that, if we make this simplification, we do have a vastly reduced parameter space. I think somebody counted there's like 105 parameters independent before I, before I do this. Now here's what I have left. I have uh, one scalar mass for every type of uh, squark and slepton. In addition, I have the soft scalar masses for, MA, uh, for the two Higgses. I have gauge genome masses for, SU, for U1, SU2, and SU3. I have three A terms, and I have mu and B mu, okay? Now, this is already too, this is still too much, okay? I don't know about you, but I can't think in a, whatever this is, 10-dimensional parameter space. Nobody can think in 10 dimensions, 
Okay? So we still need some guidance from theory, or at least some or phenomenological explanations. We need some guidance from somewhere okay, about where to look. Um, I think a very natural place to look is to think about high-scale supersymmetry breaking. That's what we talked about before. If we have some hidden sector that breaks supersymmetry at some very high scale, okay, then uh, I, I remind you, uh, but I now say it in the context of the MSSM, that we just have some uh, chiral field X from the hidden sector, its F term gets a VEB, and then we can write down all these various kinds of higher dimension operators involving X, powers of X over M. Okay? And the, 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 the nice thing about this is that if you work this out, this generates all the supersymmetry breaking parameters that you need, all the things on the previous slide, all of the same order of magnitude, fx over m. So if we assume that there's a single scale m that controls all of these terms, we automatically get all the, uh, all the soft breaking of the same size. And then, if m is some very, very high scale, could be the Planck scale, that's a choice that's often made, then you just have to choose f to be the right value to make f over m to be 1 TeV. Okay? So this is extremely compelling. And one of the things to note that, in fact, here, this particular term right here generates actually the mu term. So I could write the supersymmetric part of the theory as having no dimensionful couplings, and this automatically generates the mu term with the same size as the soft SUSY breaking masses. In most other frameworks of SUSY breaking, it's much more complicated to explain that. Okay? Here it comes out very naturally. So this is extremely compelling. Okay? And indeed, there's further support for this idea. Here we're being very, very bold. We're, if we're talking about, you know, SUSY breaking at, say, 10 to the 11 GeV, we're extrapolating this theory over many, many orders of magnitude. Okay? But one of the reasons we dare to do that is because of one, there's one major success of extrapolating physics to very uh, high energy scales, which is grand unification. Okay? So grand unification uh, works extremely well in the uh, minimal supersymmetric standard model. So the particle content of the MSSM was, of course, motivated by minimality, the minimal extension of the standard model. And we got what we got. Okay? And what it turns out is that uh, if we include the correct, if we, if, we, if we don't include, if we just look at the standard model, we get these dashed lines, and we see that the three couplings do not quite unify. Okay, that's what these dashed lines are. But if we include exactly the, the content of the MSSM, we have a threshold here, so we follow sort of the standard model, but then we have a threshold uh, at around 1 TeV, and then things unify very beautifully. They unify in a really precise way, right? And there are no adjustable parameters in this plot. Nothing, right? Three lines meeting at a point with no adjustable parameters. And these widths here are the error bars. And it's, it's quite striking because actually it turns out that the fact that we added, remember we added an extra Higgs doublet and that seemed like kind of a, I don't know, that seemed like kind of a maybe would have been better if we didn't do it kind of thing. But here it turns out that, that the, the differential, that makes a very important contribution to the differential running of these things right here. If you added more Higgs doublets, for example, you would screw this up. Okay, you'd get back something more like that. Okay? So uh, it, it, this, is, this is something that absolutely didn't have to work. It worked. Maybe there's a hint here. Maybe there's a strong hint here. Okay? So if we take this seriously, let's try to sort of think about the simplest thing we could think about. If we take this seriously, then unification suggests that, you know, the, the three gauge groups of the standard model are unified, so we would expect that at the gut scale, these gauge-eno masses should be equal to each other, right? That's a very, uh, it would be a natural thing to sort of guess, but in unification, it's actually required, right? Um, and then we can ask, okay, but that's a 10 to the 16 GeV at the unification scale. What happens at the TeV scale? We have to look at the renormalization group equations for the gauge genome mass, and they have the property, oops, these should be squared, sorry. This should be, this should be squareds down here, okay? All right, M1 over G1 squareds. 
the, M zo the, the gay genome masses divided by the appropriate gauge coupling squared should all be equal to each other at all scales. It's a simple consequence of that renormalization group equation. And so at the weak scale, you expect these, ah, man, this should be 3, 2, 1 instead of 1, 3, 3. I'm going to fire that guy, man. Okay, so, uh, all right, so the, 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 you can see from this that the, the heaviest guy is the guy with the biggest gauge coupling, right? Okay, so this should be M3, M2, M1 is 5, 2, 1, roughly. Okay, so there should be some ratio like that. That's what we believe from this. And now what about the scalar masses? Unification doesn't tell us, the unification does tell us that a lot of these things should be equal. Things that are in the same uh, multiplet should be equal to each other, right? So a lot of the scalar masses should also be equal to each other. Uh, renormalization group equations, though, are not the same for them because, for example, the colored squarks are charged under color, the biggest coupling at low energies. Okay? And so they, if we look at the renormalization group equation, there's a big term involving the uh, gluino mass correcting the squark masses. Okay? And this negative sign, remember, means that when you run down, you get a positive contribution because we're running to low energies. And so this, these things tend to make the squarks of order the gluino mass at the TeV scale. That's what these renormalization group equations tend to do. Similarly, one that's easy to forget about, but very crucial, is the parameter MH up, right? That's, we really care about that. That's the one that breaks electroweak symmetry for us. And what you see is there's, there's, the reason we care about this is there's a big contribution. Y top is the other big coupling, right? The two biggest couplings in the, in the standard model are the, the, the QCD gauge coupling and Y top, right? So whenever you want to look at RG effects, those are the first things you should look at. Um, and as this contribution is positive in the RG equation, that means that it makes MH up squared run negative. That's good, because we do want it to be negative, so that's kind of nice. That means if it starts off positive at the, at the gut scale, it can run negative. And people, some people really like that. Okay? But anyway, it's, it's fine. But the point is it's proportional to a squark mass. Squark mass is one of the big guys, right? So just like this makes the squarks be of order the gluino mass, this makes MH up squared be of order M stop. That's bad. That's very bad for naturalness, right? Remember? Because we actually, uh, right, we would actually like this to be at least a loop factor smaller than that, but this makes them equal. So it makes the naturalness problem even worse than what I've estimated before. But that's what it gives us, so, okay? And just to show you that this is not just some squiggly stuff, um, here's an example. This is a very common thing to do, is to have a phenomenological parameter space where you assume that all of these guys right here are equal to, a all the scalar masses are equal to a common value at the gut scale. All the gay genome masses are equal to a common value. And here you can see here they all are at 10 to the 16 GV. All the scalar masses have the same. But then as you run down, the squarks get dry. The, the, okay, so first of all, the, here's the, the gluino mass. The gluino mass goes up. The squark mass get dragged up with it. The sleptons stay down here. And here is the uptype Higgs mass. Okay, it's going as negative as it possibly can. It's trying to catch up with the, okay? This is a typical sort of thing that happens, okay? And of course, this is just one possibility, right? I've made many, many choices. You could say, well, why this, why that? And there are many, many other possibilities. And uh, here are just some example spectra, OK? And if you stare at these kinds of uh, pictures too long, you will go blind. And in fact, many people do. Okay, they spend their lives staring at these kinds of pictures. But these are just some theorists. You should really think of these things as just some examples. Right? We need, we, it's useful to have worked examples to do phenomenology, but you shouldn't, shouldn't take any of these things too seriously. But this gives you a little bit of an idea of what is involved in a complete model. So I have here, here's the light Higgs, here's, uh, here's some neutral fermions, which are the, the, the uh, I'll, I'll talk about these a little bit later. Anyway, you can see there's a lot of particles. And once I have one of these models, I do predict this complete spectroscopy. And I can now go and ask whether uh, this is how, wh what kind of experimental constraints there are on these kinds of spectra. Okay? 
But one of the things that almost all the spectra that come from any theory have in common is that the colored superpartners, the gluino and the squartz, are heavier than the others, than the non-colored ones. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's in common with all of these. Okay? Okay, so another thing that uh, I need to talk about before we talk about um, uh, the phenomenology is uh, our parity. Okay? So when we first wrote down the MSSM, we noticed that we could write down all these terms here, right? These terms that violate baryon number and lepton number. Okay? And if we, uh, these terms would therefore all have to be uh, highly suppressed. And so it's very uh, natural to consider the possibility that they're really absolutely suppressed or suppressed so small that we can completely ignore them, right? And this has an extremely striking consequence. If you forbid these terms, then if you look at the MSSM, then there's a Z2 symmetry, okay, under which all the ordinary particles, namely the fermions that we've seen, the gauge bosons that we've seen, and the Higgses, among one of which we've seen, okay, uh, all of these guys are even under this Z2 symmetry. All the particles that we have not seen, not all well, them, you know, the, 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 the scalar partners of all these particles here are odd, namely the squarks, the, the gauginos, and the higginos. They're all odd under this symmetry, okay? So this symmetry, this Z2 symmetry is, is called R parity, okay? And, yeah, okay? And it's, it's usual to call these supersymmetric particles, although I don't know why its partner is any less supersymmetric than this particle, but that's the, that's the terminology, okay? All right. So this R parity symmetry has an extremely important, has several extremely important, well, has one really extremely important consequence that has many consequences itself, which is that the lightest particle that is odd under this Z2 symmetry is stable because it would have to decay to something, some state that is uh, Z odd, that is, that is R parity odd. It could, of course, decay to another R parity particle plus some other stuff, but it's the lightest guy, so it can't do that. It's the lightest R parity uh, odd guy, so it can't do that. So the lightest R parity odd particle is absolutely stable. Okay? If that particle is electrically neutral, then it's a candidate for a dark matter particle, right? A WIMP needs to be a neutral particle, mass of around 100 GeV with renormalizable interactions with the standard model. Check, 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 right? So we have particles like that in the MSSM. We didn't ask for them, but we got them. Uh, and there are at least the two most natural candidates. One is the neutralino. Neutralinos are mixtures of neutral fermions, right? Any particles that have the same gauge and Lorentz quantum numbers, uh, the same gauge quantum numbers after electroweak symmetry breaking, and the same Lorentz quantum numbers can mix. And so in the MSSM, we have the Bino, the gauge, gauge partner of the, the, the U1 hypercharge gauge boson, the diagonal component of uh, the, the, the Wino, the neutral Wino, and the neutral Higginos. Those are all neutral fermions after electroweak symmetry breaking, they can mix. And the lightest guy of this is a very natural candidate for the uh, for, the, for the lightest supersymmetric particle, the LSP, okay? And that happens in many, many models. Most models, are, most models, I would say, okay? But there's another candidate that is also extremely natural, which is, uh, you know, don't forget supergravity. You might think gravity doesn't matter for particle physicists, but actually sometimes it does, because the, remember that, or don't remember, but I'm telling you again, the, the, the gravitino mass is F over M Planck, right? The gravitino mass is F over M Planck, but the Susie breaking scale was F over M. What was M? M was something that had to do with the uh, hidden sector dynamics. If M is M Planck, then these are equal, and then M three halves is of order a TeV, but if M is any is smaller than that, if I have lower scale Susie breaking, then the gravitino is always is light and is the natural candidate for, for the LSP. Okay, so these are two extremely natural candidates for the LSP. Yeah? The, 
they're, 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 they're heavy, okay? So, well, uh, they're only floating around if they're stable. So the question is, what happened? Sorry, the question is, what happened to all those particles in the hidden sector, okay? It's a similar question to what happened to all those particles at the gut scale. If I have a grand unified theory, that theory has many, many more particles, right? What happened to all of them? Well, the first answer is that they have huge masses, right? Uh, so, uh, and uh, the, we, we're, we're not bumping into them today because they're unstable, presumably. Now, of course, it's quite possible that some of them, it's possible that some of them could be stable and might have cosmological consequences, might even be dark matter or something, and we can think about that. But there's no immediate, there's no immediate problem. Okay? Right? All right? So yeah, there's not there's 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 a lot of room for fantasy there, <laughs> okay, all right, okay. So now I have enough to to tell you a little bit about how we look for supersymmetry, okay, and uh, you can already see the answer from this slide. This is uh, where's Waldo? Where do you look? You have to look everywhere, right? There isn't any. Uh, it's not uh, it's not a strong reason to look in any particular corner of that uh, picture, right? There's no, all right? So you should think about supersymmetry um, the, the same way, I would say, okay? So I should, I should well, I, I, sh I should warn you that there's no way to give a topic, I'm now gonna spend the rest of the, the lecture talking about, uh, you know, how we should look at Suzy searches, and there's no way to talk about this without editorializing, so I'm not going to make any apologies for that. And I've been editorializing the whole time, but you know, but anyway. Okay, so uh, what, is a generic, what is a generic signal in supersymmetry, okay? So we're gonna assume our parity, okay? Um, so because of our parity, these supersymmetric particles have to be produced in pairs, right? They can't be produced, so they're produced in pairs. And then each of these guys decays. If he's not already the lightest guy, he decays, right? If he's not the lightest LSP, he decays. And uh, what do they decay to? Well, they have to, at the end of the decay chain, there has to be the LSP, right? Because everything is, has to be R parity odd along the way. Okay, that's the generic signal. And so what is this LSP? Well, here I'm going to assume that the LSP is neutral. I'm sorry, I should have made that assumption explicit here. I'm going to assume that the LSP is neutral, electrically neutral. If it's electrically neutral, it's like a neutrino. Right? A neutrino, if you produce a neutrino in a detector, in a particle detector, unfortunately, we don't have the money to make the detectors big enough to detect neutrinos. We would have to make them, I don't know, miles. I don't know, miles, probably. I don't know how big they'd have to be. It's a good exercise to figure out how big of a detector would you need to do tracking for neutrinos. Anyway, we, can't, we don't have the money, so we, they just escape the detector. They don't interact, and so we have... Um, we have um, we, we see them, quote unquote, by the fact that we don't see them. Namely, there's an imbalance in the momentum transverse to the beam axis, okay? We can't keep track of the momentum along the beam axis, it's just too messy, right? There's too much crap going down the beam, all right? So we see them as missing transverse, uh, people say missing transverse energy, which is really the magnitude of the missing transverse momentum, okay? So a, a very typical example, a prototypical example, is that we produce a gluino, we produce a pair of gluinos, right? Gluinos are good because they're strongly interacting. In fact, they're in the octet representation of, of color. They have a huge, huge cross-section. So we produce a pair of gluinos, and what does each gluino want to decay to? Well, he wants to decay through its biggest coupling, which is the strong coupling, to a squark and a quark. So if a squark is lighter than the gluino, then the gluino will decay to a squark. But then the squark can decay down to, uh, if it's the lightest squark, it can't decay anymore through the colored interaction. It has to decay through an electroweak interaction to a quark and let's say a bino, which or a component of the not lightest neutralino. Okay? So it's very typical, it depends on the spectrum, of course, what's lighter than what, but it's very typical that you produce one superpartner and it decays via a cascade, right? At the end of the cascade is the lightest, the LSP, okay? So in this particular case, if we produced a pair of gluinos, we would get four jets from, because we get two gluinos, and then we would get missing energy from the two neutralinos that just escaped the detector. 
Okay? And as I said, there are many, many possibilities because we can have many, many spectra, right? Okay, it's a bewildering number of spectra, okay? Um, so what you have to do is you have to look everywhere. And the, 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 that, that, that seems like that's mathematically impossible, but you, if you look into this, you will see it's truly impressive the number of different searches, the number of different final states, and number of models that have been searched for in a dedicated way by both the ATLAS and the CMS collaboration. Okay? But you can actually uh, understand the broad features of all of these searches in a very simple way, which is that, of course, every experiment at a collider is ultimately just a counting experiment. You're counting events, right? And what you're looking for is an excess of events over what is expected in the standard model. And so the thing that controls your reach is just the event rate, okay? And typically, you have to have between 10 and 100 signal events in order to see a signal. Okay? It depends on the standard model background, of course. So this is an extremely broad brush summary. And here's a very beautiful broad brush sort of plot made by Nathaniel Craig that basically, that here on the vertical axis is the cross section in uh, Pico Barnes for various kinds of super partners that we're interested in looking for. Uh, let's start with uh, squark gluino, gluino gluino, stop stop. Neutralino, chargino, the chargino is the mixture of the charged fermions, the, the wino and the Higgs, charged hexinos, okay, and uh, sleptons. And you can see that the colored guys have the biggest, uh, biggest cross section here, and this is the mass of those particles, okay, that's the mass of the particles. So the cross sections are very, very rapidly falling functions of the mass, of course, right? And now here is the cross section that you need to get between 10 and 100 events. Okay, so this is, these regions here are where you, the bounds will be. Okay, and this, is, this plot is for the 8 TeV LHC run, the one that we just finished. Okay, you can make a similar plot for the 14 TeV run. I wish I had that plot, but I, I don't. I'll show some other things. Okay? Okay? And when I said there were a lot of searches, you know, this is a very, very executive summary. Each one of these is a supersymmetric search. There's a little footnote here somewhere that says only a selection of the <laughs> results are shown here. So this is an executive summary of the executive summary of the executive summary of all these searches. And, you know, the very, very rough message is each one of these searches is reduced to one bar, okay, which just tells you the reach in, in mass of whatever particle they were looking at. And the, here is one TeV, and you know, there's a, sort of this green tide which is sweeping over to, to one TeV. Okay? So this just gives the message that there are many, many searches, and of course, these are all limits. There have been no signal observed, not for want of trying. Right? If there if were a signal observed, believe me, you would have heard about it, and I would have talked about it in the first lecture, right? <laughs> All right, so we have to ask, in the absence of any such signal, what should we think about supersymmetry? How should we assess the impact of all of these searches? Okay, now there are many ways to do it. It's complicated. I'm going to just talk about one way to think about it. It gives you some way of trying to assess the impact. And that is, we can ask, how natural is supersymmetry in light of these various types of non-observation that we've, from the LHC? And so we can ask which supersymmetric particles are most relevant for uh, solving the problem of the large, uh, pro solving the problem of, of explaining the Higgs mass. Okay? Remember that we may have a problem in the MSSM, but maybe in some extension we can, we can solve it, and you know, the searches would apply in those models as well. So the parameters are the Higgsino mass, because remember that the mass parameter that enters the potential for the uptype Higgs mass is a combination of the soft mass and mu, right? However, mu independently also directly is the Higgsino mass. It is the Higgsino mass, so it plays this dual role. And so this mu, namely the Higgsino mass, cannot be too heavy, otherwise I'm getting a big cancellation here, okay? And so if I roughly estimate the cancellation, I need a 20% tuning for a 200 GeV 
uh, mu. And just to explain what I mean by tuning, small tuning is bad, right? 10 to the minus 3 tuning is worse than 20% tuning, okay? So this is just a, a measure of the amount of cancellation that I would need, okay? The other one is, of course, the top mass. And if you want a 20% tuning, you should have a 600 GeV stop, roughly. And the other one that might not, might not immediately realize is the gluino mass. Because the loop corrections to the, the gluino mass to the stop are so big, then to get a, if you want 20% tuning, you can't have more than about a 900 GeV gluino mass. And of course, you shouldn't take these 200, 600, and 900 numbers, you shouldn't take them in any religious strong sense. But this just gives, I'm, tr I'm trying to give you some benchmark for where you should start worrying, perhaps, about naturalness, okay? Okay, so we want to use this. So if you, if you take this point of view, that this is, what I, this is what I care most about, you should look at searches for producing stop quarks, okay? And here is a plot from uh, CMS. Uh, I have to say, I apologize. Somehow all the plots, the next plots I found, uh, the plots for CMS were better illustrated of what I wanted to say, but there are similar limits, equivalent limits from Atlas, okay? But anyway, here are the stop limits. Here is the, these assume that the stop decays to a top plus a neutral eno, in most cases, sometimes into a charge eno. Anyways, various kinds of stop decays. Here is the stop mass. Here is the LSP mass, okay? And you're, so you have to live underneath these, these, these things. These are the excluded regions. And here, for comparison, in the, sh in the, in the yellow, I've put these naturalness constraints. Okay? And you can see that, oh, yeah, it looks pretty good. We're probing most of the quote-unquote natural parameter space if we take these, these hints seriously. Okay? The situation is much stronger for Gluino searches because the Gluino, even though it can be heavier, it has a much bigger cross-section and its signals are much more striking. Okay? It decays, it de therefore decays with much more energy. And so here are the gluino limits, lots of gluino limits, and they're plotted in the plane of the gluino mass and the LSP mass, okay? And here's the natural region, the same natural region I estimated before. It is now obliterated, okay? But the life of an experimentalist is very hard because it's very hard to satisfy theorists because we went and told the experimentalists they should exclude this, and they did, but then we say, oh, oh, but you got 1,300 TV. Well, now the tuning is only 10%. <laughs> All right? But you can imagine how much work went into each one of these searches. But anyway, we sh if we really believed in naturalness, we should have found it, right? Okay? Here's, here's I want to show one set of plots. I'm, I'm going to go over by just about five minutes, okay? But not more than that. So I, I'm aware of the time. Um, uh, I want to talk about electroweak enos. Okay, electroweak enos are the, the neutral and charged fermions, the, the Higgs enos, Wienos, and Binos, okay, which are, all, which are generally lighter. And I just want, even though those don't have much directly to do with naturalness, it's striking that, uh, I show this plot because there are actually quite strong exclusion limits. And notice that along this diagonal line right here, I, I, the, 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 the heavier guy can just barely decay into the lighter guy. There's like zero phase space for that. There's essentially no missing energy in this signal because all the energy is going into the, the well, Anyway, there's no, there's no missing transverse energy along this line, essentially. And yet, the bounds are extremely strong here. This plot also illustrates another point, which is that uh, what are these different tiles here? Each one of these tiles right here is actually a different search. Because if you have, the, if you, have a, you know, a, a, a mass that lives, say, in this little guy right here, you should do a different search because your signal looks different than if you're up here. And for each one of these tiles, they have done the optimum search. Okay? So I'm just trying to give you an idea of how hard people have been looking for supersymmetry. They have optimized this plot everywhere here. Okay? Now, that was all these plots that I showed you are the present limits for the, eight t so the, the past eight TeV run of the LHC. Of course, we are now just starting a 13 TeV run, which is going to have an enormous increase in both energy and luminosity. 
Okay, so what are the prospects for these various searches? Here is the stop search at 14 TeV. Even though we have a 13 TeV run, these projections were made for 14 TeV. It doesn't matter, okay? All right, it's not a big difference. Here are the present projected, uh, the, 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 the present stop searches roughly. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, okay. Yes, here are the present limits, okay? Uh, and here is the, 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 the natural region. And these two things here are the projected limits at 14 TeV. This one is made under more optimistic assumptions than this one. Okay? The assumptions have to do with assumptions about errors, not theory. Er theory, they, they don't know what the experiment or errors, errors will be until they do the experiment. And so that's the uncertainty here. But you can see it's a huge increase. We're improbing much, much larger parameter space. This parameter space we're presently probing is almost negligible compared to the, what we're going to get. Okay? And for gluinos, it's even more impressive. Here was that natural region. Here were the previous bounds. Bloop. Here's what we're going to get at 14 TeV. Okay? So there's a huge increase in reach here. Okay? Here's electroweak enos. Okay? And here, again, are the present and uh, projected reaches. Okay? Now here I want to make a point, which is that uh, we have these huge uncertainty in, you know, it would be much better to have this than have this. Are the experimentalists going to be able to do this? I predict yes, okay? because they always do. Experimentalists at Hadron machines always do better than they are supposed to do. Here's an example. This plot was actually made before they actually did the search at 8 TeV. This was what the 8 TeV bound was supposed to be. Here's what it is. I just superimposed the other plot on top. Okay, I sort of stretched it to make it the same. Here's what they actually got, right? Remember underneath there was this little bloop thing. So I predict they're gonna do this or better. Okay, they always do that. They're always conservative, they're, okay? So anyway, it looks fantastic. They're gonna get a huge amount of reach. Okay, so that's really all I've got time for. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave you with some, some, some final thoughts. Okay. So already in the 1990s, a very distinguished uh, Italian theoretical physicist, Guido Altarelli, said the train of supersymmetry is late. It's very late now. Right? We really expected it much sooner. Okay? People have been working on supersymmetry for a long time, many people. You know, we have to think about it. Should we keep going? I think it's fair to say that supersymmetry needs either fine-tuning or non-minimal structure, maybe both, probably both, I don't know, okay? One thing I want to leave you with, though, about the tuning, I want to really emphasize, is that it is one tuning. It's one tuning. Why is it one tuning? All the way back in the beginning of the first lecture, I emphasized that the standard model has one relevant parameter. If you tune that one relevant parameter, the standard model is perfect. And that has its reflection in any extension of the standard model. If I can tune to get the standard model, I'm really only tuning one, one combination of parameters, the combination of parameters that ends up being the Higgs mass, the 125 GeV Higgs mass. So there's one combination of parameters in the MSSM that is, that is tuned, and it's basically MH up squared. Okay, in the MSSM, because of the large effect of the stop, that's what it is. And so a very wise man from the... 13th century uh, told us that, taught us that when we think about nature, we should not multiply, entities should not be multiplied by, beyond necessity, right? We should not introduce more idea, more things, more concepts, more particles <laughs> than we have to, okay? And that's, there's a lot of truth to that, right? Even all these centuries later. And I, if you, especially if you look at the alternatives, I would say that the MSSM, possibly with some 1% tuning, or maybe even worse, is, is still perhaps the most compelling framework for particle physics. Actually, I would probably say the MSSM or some, some extension. Okay? So supersymmetry with 1% uh, tuning. Okay? And so what are the implications of that? If we take this point of view seriously, we would say, the most likely place to find supersymmetry is right around the corner. <laughs> and it sounds like a joke, 
But it's not, it's true. If we take these ideas seriously, that's what it implies, okay? And so we should really keep looking for these supersymmetric signals. We shouldn't give up if we take this kind of point of view, all right? But uh, finally, let me just say that, you know, uh, uh, in science, we, all, we always have the privilege of standing on the shoulders of the people that came before us, and certainly, you know, we all benefit from that, and this lecture has been my attempt to try and pass the torch to you guys. You guys are the future of science. You guys have to figure out what to do with this situation that we've left you with, and uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.